is any mountain really worth a life? Of which the clear answer is no. But at the time, you're, sometimes your ambition is, you know, it's like, we're going to go for it. Mount Everest is a wonder. It's probably the most majestic thing you'll ever see. And for most people, this is just a mountain you can see through pictures, but a courageous few actually end up seeing it in person, standing at 29,031 feet above sea level. This is a mountain that's almost impossible to summit. You know, and sometimes you, you take on these big projects and it's about, come on, we're gonna do it, and you're, you're full of that confidence. But that doesn't stop the real adventurers from trying anyway. The mountain has already claimed close to 350 lives already. And every year, th that number climbs up, more and more, and the horrors just get worse than you could ever imagine. What they just captured on Mount Everest scared the entire world. Join us as we bring you the reality of what they found on the mountain and what it really means for anyone even thinking about heading on this treacherous summit. Mount Everest isn't just grand in terms of how it looks. This beast of a mountain makes sure that everyone knows how powerful it is. Located in the Himalayas, it requires a lot of strength and training to even get to the base camp, let alone make it all the way to the top. But those that do have an incredible view, but at the same time, horrors to look forward to. On May 29, 2019, Dr. Peter Lowry was minutes away from his dream of making it all the way to the top of Mount Everest. It was something he had spent his whole adult life building up to. He knew that the journey was going to be extremely hard, but he had the training for it, and he knew he'd make it, and he did. It was clear to him that there's a chance he'd see dead bodies along the top of the mountain. With all the people that have died there, that's going to be fairly normal. What he didn't expect, though, was to run into the body of someone who passed away just 24 hours before he got there, someone he knew. Peter was at what's called the death zone. The death zone on Mount Everest refers to altitudes above 26,000 feet, where the atmospheric pressure of oxygen becomes so low that it cannot sustain human life for an extended period. And by that, we mean it's mere minutes before time runs out. At this extreme height, the amount of oxygen in the air drops by around 40% compared to sea level, making it incredibly challenging for the human body to get the necessary oxygen for survival. The concept of the death zone was first introduced by Edouard Weiss Dunant, a Swiss doctor in 1953, who originally referred to it as the lethal zone. One of the craziest things here is that you can find this zone on all 14 peaks above 8,000 meters in the Himalayas and Karakoram mountain ranges of Asia, which are some of the highest and most formidable in the world. Climbers attempting to reach these high altitudes have to make sure that they allow their bodies time to acclimate to the lower oxygen levels by employing a method known as climb high, sleep low, this means spending several weeks ascending Mount Everest, ascending and descending at various stages to rest and adapt at lower altitudes every few thousand feet. Proper acclimatization is crucial to reduce the risk of serious altitude-related illnesses, which can also be fatal. Entering the death zone without supplementary oxygen is an incredibly risky thing to do. Climbers who spend an extended period above 8,000 meters without the aid of supplemental oxygen experience a decline in their bodily functions, leading to extreme fatigue, cognitive impairment, and eventually, death. So, most climbers carry oxygen cylinders to breathe in the death zone, which provides a lifeline to stay alive and function better in such harsh conditions. But of course, there's only so much oxygen you can carry. At the same time though, the area itself is impossible for a new climber to deal with too. Navigating through the death zone on Mount Everest demands not only physical strength and endurance, but also a set of technical skills essential for surviving the extremely difficult climb. As climbers ascend into this zone, there are longs of challenges that await them. One of the first ones being crevasses. These are deep cracks or fissures in the ice or snow hidden beneath the seemingly smooth surface. These chasms can be several meters wide and go down to unimaginable depths. They are formed because of the movement of the glacier and can change position and size over time. When covered by a thin layer of snow, they become particularly hazardous, as they may appear as harmless snow bridges. If a climber mistakenly steps on such a snow bridge, it could collapse, plunging them into the abyss below within seconds. To navigate crevasses safely, climbers need to be prepared. 
One of the most critical skills they need here is route finding. Experienced climbers and guides can identify potential crevasse-prone areas and choose the safest path through the glacier. That doesn't mean they have to go in empty-handed, though. Climbers may use specialized equipment like probes and ice screws to test the snow and ice for stability. Roping up in a team and maintaining the correct spacing between climbers can distribute the load, reducing the risk of falling into a crevasse together. Sometimes climbers also have to cut the rope altogether, so if one falls, that's the only life at stake. It sounds heartless, but in that situation, this is the only thing that truly makes sense. Negotiating through these areas involves careful observation and swift decision-making. Climbers often seek advice from experienced guides who can identify safe routes and assess the risk of potential seric collapses. Proper timing is crucial here. Climbers typically make their way through the hazardous areas early in the morning when the temperature is lower, reducing the likelihood of icefall. But remember how we talked about the fact that in the death zone, there isn't the same amount of oxygen that the human body is used to. Well, because of that everything becomes more challenging, it can impair decision-making and physical coordination, which are the two most important things you need when you're climbing your way to the top. These are the things Dr. Peter knew to come prepared for. But recently, Mount Everest has had a bit of a problem. Capitalism. Now sure, capitalism has always been a thing. Why else would governments spend so much money trying to attract people to come climb the mountain? This is different though. On average, one person pays anywhere from $30,00 to $100,000, or even more than that in some cases, to even attempt the climb. Regardless of whether they actually make it to the top or not, this meant that the only people that would actually make it here were the ones that were passionate about climbing and had experience, as well as the patience to save that much money to go. But nowadays, you can even find deals that take you there for $20,000 or less. You know what they say, though, you get what you pay for. With the costs lowering, people end up with inexperienced Sherpas, and those Sherpas also don't do their homework. People that don't have the necessary experience to be summiting end up on the mountain anyway. With that, you have hundreds of more people attempting the climb every year. That means that people that are experienced, have the training, end up lagging behind anyway because the mountain isn't like an open road. There are only really small paths that you have to make your way through, and if too many people are hogging it up, everyone slows down. On May 22, 2019, seasoned climber Nermal Purja posted a photo on his Instagram account, showing the reality of what's really going on on the toughest mountain in the world. In the viral photo, you can see 320 people attempting to get to the Everest base camp. When you think about this from an everyday standpoint, 320 people doesn't sound like that much, but when you're talking about a peak like this, it's almost 300 too many. The mountain already doesn't have a lot of oxygen. Add to that over 600 lungs and you're just accelerating the depletion here. It's hard to imagine oxygen running out under the open sky, but that can happen fairly quickly here. That's what happened right in front of Nermal's eyes when he was making the climb. But the harrowing reality of it all really came to light when Dr. Peter made it to the same spot just days later. When he got there, he didn't see the 300 people line, or any people at all for that matter. He made it there with just his group, but he could tell that something major had happened just one day before. He first saw there the body of Indian climber Anjali Sharad, a 54-year-old who passed away. After reaching the summit alongside her husband, she collapsed due to the extreme conditions at such high altitude. Lowry's team included experienced Sherpas who had noticed Kolkarn's struggle during her ascent and had urged her to turn back. They were concerned about her well-being and warned her that continuing to climb could be dangerous. But despite the advice, Kolkarn chose to continue her push to the summit. Regrettably, after reaching the top of Everest, her condition deteriorated rapidly and she was unable to make it back down to lower altitudes. Despite their best efforts, there was nothing the Sherpas or any other climbers could do to save her. The harsh reality of Everest's death zone meant that once someone's health reaches a critical point, rescue attempts become extremely challenging and often impractical due to the risks involved. Lowry expressed his opinion that Kolkarn should not have attempted to climb Everest in the first place. And what's even worse is the fact that now her body will stay there forever as bringing a body down from Mount Everest is one of the hardest things to do, and it can put the search team's lives at risk, too. That's something people know about before they sign up. 
so the only thing the Sherpa and the rest of the group can do in a situation like this is keep going. Whether that means going up and completing the climb without them, or return to the base camp. You'd think that something like this would only happen to experienced climbers, but that's not the case here. At the same point in the mountain, Lowry also found the lifeless body of Don Cash, a 54-year-old man from Utah who he had spent time with during their January expeditions up Antarctica's Vincent Massif. During their ascent of Vincent Massif, Lowry and Cash had crossed paths and ended up really connecting with in their time together. They shared stories of their mountaineering experiences, and Cash told him all about the frostbite he had suffered on a previous climb of Denali, because of which he ended up losing a few fingers. Even during their Antarctic expedition, Cash had gotten frostbite on his nose, which while is one of the scariest thoughts you could have, also showed how dedicated the man had been about climbing these beastly mountains throughout his life, and now he'll forever be on one. Donald Cash was a 54-year-old software salesman from Sandy, Utah, and he pursued an extraordinary goal to conquer the tallest mountain on each of the seven continents. In December, he boldly quit his job to focus on completing the last two summits on his list. His ultimate dream was to scale Mount Everest, the highest peak in the world, and prove that he could truly do it all. On his adventurous journey to the top of Everest, Cash faced the harsh reality of high-altitude sickness. Despite the efforts of his Sherpa guides from Pioneer Adventures, he fainted on the summit and shortly after, the lack of oxygen took over. He could not be revived. His children, Brandolin and Tanner Cash, believe he suffered a heart attack, adding to the heartbreak of losing their adventurous father. Donald Cash's passion for mountaineering was unmatched, driving him to embark on this epic quest back in 2015. He embraced all the challenges that came with climbing the world's most formidable peaks, even though it took a toll on his health, leaving him with the scars of frostbite. Everything he went through just drove him to keep on going anyway. Before setting out on his final climb, Cash's family gathered to bless him and show their support for what he really believed him, knowing that he might not come back. If that's not obvious enough, he had even signed a document that said that if he were to end up dying on any of the mountains he set out to climb, that he should be left there forever. Unlike Angeli, Cash didn't even want to return. While the locals will respect his wishes, it's just going to be one more hurdle for people to get through in the death zone. Now they don't just have to worry about the oxygen and maintaining their footing, they also have to prepare to see the bodies of people who have just passed away mere hours before their arrival. And for the most part, things might stay this way. Because things are kind of like this. In early May, the monsoon season approaches, shifting the jet stream and creating a window of opportunity for climbers to tackle Mount Everest. In 2019, Sherpas were able to set fixed ropes on the mountain in mid-May, but strong winds forced climbers to wait. Finally, on May 20th, forecasts indicated that the winds were settling, opening the summit window. Climbers who had been acclimatizing at Camp 2 prepared for their summit push, knowing that oxygen supply would dictate their timeline beyond that point. The weather delay led to a surge of climbers relying on oxygen, causing traffic to pile up below the summit on May 22nd. However, climbers like Peter Lowry, who were part of experienced teams, managed to avoid the crowds, ensuring a smoother ascent. Alan Arnett, a Fort Collins mountaineer with extensive experience on Everest, has been closely monitoring climbing activity on the peak for over 20 years. During the 2019 season, he observed 885 climbers reaching the summit, with 621 approaching from Nepal and 264 from Tibet. Among the 11 fatalities on Everest this year, Arnett believes many of them were actually fairly preventable. He attributes the increasing deaths to the rise of less experienced, often Nepal-based, guiding companies offering discounted trips. Eight of the deaths involved clients of these low-cost operators, while three occurred with traditional high-end operators. But all suffered the same fate. Arnett also talked about the sheer importance of experienced guides' responsibility to make tough decisions, including turning climbers around when necessary. The death zone above 8,000 meters can be treacherous, and climbers who linger too long, particularly due to crowds, may suffer oxygen shortages and impaired judgment. Turning around in such situations can save lives, but some inexperienced companies fail to prioritize this crucial aspect of guiding. And the wrong guide can make or break the whole climb. So, there's a clear need for things to improve, and that too, fast.
This isn't just something for the government, though. Everyone will have a part in it. First of all, implementing and enforcing strict regulations on the number of permits issued each season is a critical step in managing the overcrowding and safety issues on Mount Everest. As we've talked about earlier on in the video, the number of climbers attempting to summit Everest has been on the rise, leading to increased congestion on the mountain during peak climbing seasons. Not only does that lead to dangerous traffic jams at key sections of the climb, such as the Hillary Step and other narrow passages, when climbers are stuck in queues, they face prolonged exposure to extreme weather conditions, which can increase the risk of frostbite, hypothermia, and exhaustion. Additionally, the delay can deplete their oxygen supplies and lead to crucial delays in the overall ascent, which can have a trickle-down effect on the entire season of climbers. On top of all of that, overcrowding can hinder emergency response efforts in case of accidents or medical emergencies. Helicopter rescue operations become much more challenging and dangerous in crowded and high-altitude conditions. Limited resources and manpower may struggle to cope with multiple emergencies simultaneously putting climbers' lives at greater risk. By limiting the number of permits issued each season, authorities can control the flow of climbers and reduce the risks associated with overcrowding. This allows for better crowd management, smoother ascent and descent processes, and less strain on resources. It also enables climbers to spread out more evenly throughout the climbing season, reducing the chances of peak congestion. Implementing regulations like this isn't easy, though. There might need to be a quota system, setting a maximum number of climbers permitted on the mountain during each season. The quota can be based on factors like the carrying capacity of the route, the availability of resources for rescue operations, and the overall impact on the environment. With that, the process of obtaining permits could involve stricter screening and qualification criteria. Climbers would need to demonstrate their experience in high-altitude mountaineering, providing evidence of successful climbs on other challenging peaks before being allowed to attempt Everest. While regulating the number of permits is crucial, it is essential to strike a balance between managing the risks and respecting the aspirations of climbers, which is also where the problem always arises when this question comes up. How do you really tell someone, who might be as passionate as Cash was, that they're not allowed to go on the summit, no matter how much they want to? Also, there needs to be a clear way that protects the people that are already on the mountain too. Developing and enforcing clear turnaround protocols is one of the most crucial things for enhancing safety on Mount Everest. Turnaround protocols are specific guidelines that climbers and guides have to follow when confronted with adverse conditions or safety concerns during their ascent. These protocols prioritize the well-being of climbers and aim to prevent risky situations that could lead to fatalities. There are a few layers to this one, though. Weather conditions on Everest can change rapidly, and storms or high winds at high altitudes pose significant dangers. Turnaround protocols should specify wind speed limits or other weather parameters, beyond which climbers must turn back, ensuring they don't end up getting caught in life-threatening situations. To address the issue of overcrowding, turnaround protocols should take into account the maximum number of climbers allowed on specific sections of the route. Guides should be prepared to make the tough decision to turn their teams around if they encounter excessive crowds avoiding bottlenecks and long delays. There also needs to be more of the climber's oxygen supply and the timing necessary to safely reach and descend from the summit. Effective management of climber's oxygen supply and timing is crucial for their safety on Mount Everest. To ensure their well-being and a successful summit attempt, several key measures come into play. Firstly, climbers must use reliable and efficient oxygen systems that deliver a consistent flow of supplemental oxygen. High-quality masks and regulators are essential to prevent oxygen wastage and ensure a steady supply during the ascent and descent. This would be costly, which, as we've seen, is something that a lot of climbers aren't really that keen on these days. And making something like this mandatory would be fairly difficult too, but it is still one of the best ways to make sure that people have the maximum amount of support they can to get through the whole journey. Climbers should also be educated on how to manage their oxygen flow rates effectively. Understanding how to adjust flow rates based on the level of physical exertion and the oxygen consumption rate is crucial to optimize oxygen usage. This would help them regardless of how close they are to their Sherpa. Guides and climbers should closely monitor oxygen levels and assess the remaining supply during the ascent. Turnaround protocols should include specific thresholds for oxygen reserves, prompting climbers to make timely decisions to descend if they are running low on oxygen. 
These protocols are essential for safety, as running out of oxygen at high altitudes can lead to severe consequences. In addition to the primary oxygen supply, climbers should carry backup oxygen cylinders in case of emergencies or unexpected delays. Having spare cylinders can provide a safety net in situations where climbers might need to spend more time at high altitudes than initially planned. Proper oxygen management during rest breaks is also crucial. Climbers should be encouraged to conserve oxygen while resting and optimize its use to ensure they have enough for critical parts of the climb. Regular communication with guides is vital. Climbers must relay information about their oxygen usage and any issues they may be facing. Guides can assess oxygen levels and advise climbers on when to turn back if necessary, taking into account their oxygen reserves. The descent is physically demanding too, and ensuring an adequate oxygen supply is critical for maintaining mental clarity and physical performance during this phase of the climb. The dangers of climbing Mount Everest extend beyond the crevices and icy terrain. A climber's own safety may seem somewhat assured by being attached to a rope if they were to fall into a crevice, but witnessing the risks faced by the Sherpas adds another layer of concern to the expedition. Sherpas play a crucial role in supporting climbers during their ascent, and their welfare is essential to the success of the expedition. Sherpas are often paid based on the load or weight they carry up and down the mountain, creating a financial incentive to complete multiple rotations quickly. This pressure to maximize their earnings can lead some Sherpas to cut corners on safety measures, putting themselves at great risk. It is disheartening to see them neglecting basic safety practices, like not clipping into safety ropes or wearing helmets, but it happens every day. The consequence of such risk-taking became clearer than ever when news spread of a Sherpa falling into a massive crevice beyond Camp 1 and losing his life. A rescue team had to retrieve the Sherpa's body, which had bled all the way up the icy face of the crevice. The incident deeply affected climbers, putting the ambition to reach the summit into perspective and a lot of people even ended up turning around and making their way back down the mountain because of it. But even if you take that out of the equation here, something as simple as Mount Everest's immense size presents a unique challenge for climbers, both physically and mentally. When you see it from afar, it looks like a beautiful painting, but as you get closer, it becomes so massive that it's tough to make sense of what you're looking at. It's like the mountain is hiding parts of itself until you reach certain points on your climb. For example, you can't see Camp 3 until you're at Camp 2, and Camp 4 only comes into view when you're going up around the side of the mountain. Even on the day you're supposed to reach the summit, Everest still looks imposing and unyielding. Dealing with the mountain's size can be a significant mental challenge during the climb. Reaching the top of Everest isn't just about physical strength, it's also about having the right mindset. Climbers need to stay focused and determined breaking the journey into manageable steps. They have to cope with the overwhelming scale of the mountain and keep their eyes on the ultimate goal, the summit, which is something that most people end up struggling with. Debris is also a constant danger on Mount Everest, making the climb challenging and potentially hazardous. Unlike some other mountains, Everest officially doesn't require highly technical climbing skills, but climbers still need to be cautious about where they step. The changing climate, Specifically, global warming has led to less snowfall and increased dryness on the mountain. As a result, Everest sheds a layer of ice and rocks that can come tumbling down the slopes. The terrain becomes a treacherous obstacle course, with debris ranging from small rocks to massive boulders the size of cars. Climbers have to negotiate this unstable terrain carefully, always watching for falling rocks and being prepared for unexpected dangers. The risk of rockfalls and avalanches is actually a constant concern, and climbers have to remain vigilant and make strategic decisions to minimize exposure to hazardous areas. Even in the less technically challenging sections of the climb, the threat of debris is ever-present, and climbers must be prepared to react quickly to any potential hazards. Fear of failure is also a significant concern for climbers attempting to conquer Mount Everest. Beyond the physical and mental challenges, funding the expedition is a major hurdle. Planning a trip to Everest is a considerable financial investment. Moreover, with so many climbers aspiring to reach the summit, standing out and securing sponsorship can be incredibly difficult. For some climbers, contacting numerous companies in search of sponsorship becomes a lengthy and frustrating process. It often requires a stroke of luck to find the right sponsor at the right time. Once sponsorship is secured, climbers carry the weight of expectations from the sponsor and others who have invested in their journey. 
The fear of letting anyone down becomes an added pressure, causing anxiety and self-doubt. The mental burden of knowing that so many people have supported and believed in their ascent can be overwhelming. The fear of failure can play a significant role in climbers' minds, affecting their confidence and decision-making during the climb. It's a constant battle against self-doubt and the realization that success is never guaranteed on Everest. Climbers have to figure out how to grapple with the possibility of not reaching the summit, despite the immense effort and resources invested. But even with that done, we have one final thing to worry about here. Even the Sherpas and climbers that are so used to making the whole journey will start to see some major changes nowadays. Climate change is having a significant impact on Mount Everest, affecting various aspects of the mountain and the surrounding region. One of the most noticeable effects is the rapid retreat of glaciers, such as the South Coal Glacier, due to rising temperatures. The loss of snow cover and thinning of ice have far-reaching consequences for the millions of people who rely on meltwater from these glaciers in the high mountains of Asia. There's also the fact that climate change is altering the weather patterns on Everest, making them more unpredictable and dangerous for climbers. The melting ice in the Himalayas contributes to increased risks of avalanches and rockfalls, posing serious hazards for those attempting to reach the summit. The recent climbing season in 2023 witnessed tragic deaths attributed to the changing weather conditions. The local communities residing near Mount Everest, particularly the Sherpas who serve as guides, are also feeling the impact of climate change. Rising temperatures and shifting weather patterns directly affect their lives and livelihoods. The challenges posed by these changes require adaptation and resilience from the people who call the Himalayan region their home. Although with all of that, it's extremely interesting to see that according to recent studies, the air pressure near Everest's summit is rising, leading to more oxygen availability for climbers. While this might appear beneficial for climbers, it brings new challenges as well. The increased oxygen availability may attract more climbers to attempt the ascent, potentially leading to overcrowding and accidents on the mountain. After all of that, though, you'd think that maybe those who reach the top would get an extraordinary view. But that's not what ends up happening. Reaching the summit of Mount Everest is an extraordinary achievement, but the reality of the experience can be far from it. The summit is a hostile and challenging place to be. The low oxygen levels create a harsh and unforgiving environment, making it feel like a scene out of a horror movie. The extreme winds at the summit add an element of suspense and danger to the situation. Climbers are far from help, and the sense of isolation is overwhelming. Then comes the realization that nobody is coming to rescue you, which intensifies the gravity of the situation. The summit is a place where nature reigns supreme, and climbers are fully exposed to its raw power. The lack of oxygen, or hypoxia, at such high altitudes can impair judgment and cognitive function. Climbers may experience disorientation and forget even basic tasks, such as taking photos for their sponsors. The focus becomes solely on survival and coping with the effects of extreme hypoxia, and you've also got the fatigue factor. While there's a lot of training you can go through to make things as easy as possible, on the way down, you don't have the same adrenaline that took you up there in the first place, which doesn't just slow down the descent at the same time, it puts everyone around that person in trouble too. But what do you think? Is there really any hope left for Mount Everest? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and like always, we'll see you in the next one.